NVIDIA may be America's top performing stock after more than doubling this year alone. But if you're holding NVIDIA or thinking of buying it to get a stake in the 7 trillion AI market, you're going to want to see Mark Chaikin's new AI prediction first. Mark is a regular on many major news outlets from Fox Business to CNBC and built the stock indicator Wall Street uses to find winning stocks. His award-winning system flashed buy on Tesla before it climbed 335%, Moderna before it climbed 300%, and Riot Blockchain before it climbed 10,090%. It also found Nvidia at the start of 2023 before its massive bull run. But right now, Mark is stepping forward to warn people to stay away from Nvidia. My system has indicated that NVIDIA is no longer the best stock to buy to profit from AI, Mark says. In fact, it just flashed buy on a totally different AI stock. And today, he'd like to hand you the name and ticker symbol of his number one AI stock to buy right now. For a limited time, you can get this information for free at AIFrenzy2023.com. Again, that's AIFrenzy2023.com for a free copy of his new report. Hi, this is Daniela Camboni and welcome back to the Daniela Camboni Show on the road here in Colorado Springs while we're covering the Denver Gold Forum. And joining me back on the show is fan favorite Willem Middlecope. He's the author of The Big Reset. He's also the man behind the Commodity Discovery Fund. Willem, good to be reunited with you. Welcome back to the show. Good to be back. I was going to say, what's new? <laughs> so much is new. Where to begin? Let's oh, wow. Start, I know, right? When was the last time we met? Five months ago? Six months ago? Zuri? Yeah, about half a year, and I know we're going to see each other. It was a bit colder? It was a little bit colder you than here. Freezing? I was freezing. <laughs> I tried not to show it. Uh, so a lot no. has changed, right? How quickly things change. So let's start by talking about what's happening in the gold market. I was just on the Ultimate Gold panel, and I brought up how, you know, you see the mainstream headlines. Gold is boring. Nothing's happening in gold. Yeah. Right, at least in North America, yeah. you could argue no, but at least that's what they're telling us. But in China, in Japan, let's look at what's happening there. Gold mm. just hitting a record high against the Japanese yen and Chinese premiums. Yeah, huge premiums, six to ten percent so, for precious metals. Okay, is this something we should be reading into because it caught a lot of interest on social media? Is there something behind that? You know, it's just like when the news broke and i helped a bit uh, that the russian embassy in kenya said we will introduce a gold backed uh, BRICS currency in august of course there were people critics who said well won't happen and it didn't happen in the end but we know it's a sign of things coming so the broader trend is we move away and we move to a parallel system a BRICS system but we'll touch on that later but the same goes for this gold premia story from China. It could be because of capital restrictions, so internal mm -hmm. financial rules within China that you have this bifurcation. But I think we're on the verge of a very serious revaluation of, of gold. gold. Yeah. And I've been, uh, yeah. I've been writing yeah, about that for I 10 know. years. I know, you've been warning us about this, but it just seems like everything's just coming together. And if I could just spend a little bit more time on, on, on China, because the, the, the appetite for gold is there, not just from individual investors, retail investors, but the central bank, 10 consecutive months of buying. China also cutting its holding of U.S. Treasuries to its lowest level since 2009. But there's more, much more to the story. The central bank of Poland is buying a lot of gold. You know, this part of the EU, the, central, the Czech National Bank is increasing its gold holdings tenfold. Same goes for Hungary, tenfold. Um, and we had the president of the Bundesbank and our own Dutch National Bank coming with statements. They could use a gold revaluation to fix the balance sheet of central banks. They were bringing this up in an interview on Dutch TV without any question about it. Wow. And I, yeah. I'm, I'm connected to the OMVIV, which is a London-based think tank on mon monetary affairs. I got a request to write a piece how gold revaluation can help central bank balance sheets. Normally, we needed to tell them yes, that yes, gold revaluation yes, yeah. could. Now I get a request from London if I could write a piece about that. And, 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 and you yeah. know, the OMVIV is, is a think tank in w where the central banks 
meet the private sector and they would never ask me ask me to do this when it would be too sensitive so in a way and that's what i always read uh, wrote in the big reset you will get a gold revaluation re by market forces or by design by central banks because they needed to fix their balance sheets people central banks have awakened to the need for gold no it's not it's not waking up they always knew in that toolbox they could use a gold revaluation, but they talk, don't talk about that only when it's really needed, only when, we, when you reach the point that there's no other tool they can use right, to fix right, it. Right, right, right. So they always knew this. They're, and that's why I never received any serious criticism on my gold revaluation story. So, so I'm going to ask you to, to hypothesize here. Because it's always interesting to, to think what's really happening behind the, the doors and walls of the central bank. Do you think that there's intelligent people within each realm that's saying we need to buy more gold? Or is one central bank just watching what another central bank is doing and saying, oh, they're buying more, we should be buying more? I, I always said that central bankers are very smart, intelligent people. Although they receive mm -hmm. a lot of flack yep. and they might have made a lot of mistakes. Yep. But I, I think in the end... They're pretty good people, you know. They d they don't make millions, you know. They work as uh, some kind of civil servant for a normal salary until they leave yes. and write a book. Yeah, sure. Okay. And they, and they do the speaker <laughs> circle. Right. I, I shouldn't be too uh, positive about them because then I receive <laughs> flack again, just like Klaus Schwab. <laughs> and we'll I'll get to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. So okay. um, so I've been always very critical on central bankers, but I always said they know their stuff. Yep. They know the history. They're great, they're very intelligent people, they studied it, and they know what the role of gold is. And that's why they never sold their gold. They only sold, some of them Except sold their Canada. gold, and England, <laughs> but they only did that on request of the US, because the US never sold one ounce. Right. Yeah? So, you mentioned the BRICS. We spoke before the summit. The summit concluded, we have six new countries, part of the BRICS, and 20 other nations dying to get an invitation. I'm sure you hear it all the time, but Willem, who cares about the BRICS? Even if they're adding more countries, it won't really add up to anything. What do you say <laughs> when you hear that counter-argument? In 2015, there was a statement coming from Moscow that Moscow and Beijing were seeking a reconstruction of the current world order together. So this has been coming a long time. It's almost 10 years now. And if you still think you can ignore this, and be an arrogant, well, American or European citizen, thinking nothing will change and uh, the whole BRICS balloon will burst right. one day. One example, there's a new maritime cooperation between the Saudis, the UAE, Iran and Oman. These guys used to be training together with the US, they used to be friends for the US, so the Gulf of Oman and the Gulf where all the oil flows through, they have a maritime agreement together. It's telling. So it's one little right. example that the BRICS is for real, it, and, uh, and in five to ten years time we'll look back and say, uh, oh, what happened? Why aren't we talking more about the energy dominance of the BRICS? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's enough said, OPEC. It's right? new OPEC. This is, know? together, they're the yeah. largest consumers, right? Oh, so yeah. we have the energy dominance. We have Saudi, you know, yeah. uh, closing the tap on oil here. And Saudi stopped buying treasuries as well. This is often overlooked. All people in our industry know that the Russians stopped buying treasuries. Most know the Chinese stopped buying treasuries as well, but they didn't so, 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 um, sell their treasuries. But the Saudis stopped buying treasuries in 2020. And you know, when you stop buying treasuries for the US, you turn from a friend into a foe. And if you, but, but you need to see all the signs. And it's just like in primary school or pre-primary school, you have to draw an elephant and you have to draw one till point 80 and then you see that it's a big elephant. If you connect all these dots, it, it, that's the big, but, but, the but, big well, elephant in the room. <laughs> play it out for us. I mean, so what's going to happen? Is the U.S. just going to isolate themselves? No, because the U.S. will 
keep the Western alliance alive and they will keep using the dollar. And never forget, I think 80% of the world trade is still done in dollars. Right. But the BRICS are in a way dethroning the US, but that doesn't mean the US will collapse and the dollar will collapse. The British pound is still around, the British empire isn't around anymore. So I think the BRICS are working on a parallel trading system, a parallel financial system, like the communist bloc had in, in, in the right. 60s, 50s Which and 60s. Which would make sense. Sure. They just ignore you. They just do trade right. with themselves and this in non-dollar terms. Was the, would you say this was all sparked with sanctions on Russia? This, this has been in the making since 2015. Actually, since the fall of Lehman. Because then they understood America, you know, the emperor d doesn't wear any clothes. You know, they were aware of that. Right. But it really kicked into higher gear. It's slowly then suddenly, and we're in the suddenly right. phase. The yeah. river runs deep. But will we become a world of G7 versus BRICS? In another interview, I concluded that this is financial, economic World War III already. And people are always a bit shocked when you use these words. Right. But l l look at the trade between China and US. It's falling off a cliff. Um, we reached the end of over 30 years globalization, more globalization, more cooperation. And now we enter the new trend of confrontation. And, and, and this will have enormous effects on the precious metals market. It will have effect in, in many ways. We obviously don't want to talk about the, con the concept or the, the prospect of a World War III, but people are talking about it. And the threat of, uh, of, of a war, I mean, it almost seems unfathomable, but between China and the USA. The Rand Corporation just published a study that the US needs to accept 800 dead soldiers in a major conflict with, Ch with China. Why are they putting that out? Why are people calling the US for a major war with China? Because China is getting stronger every year and if we want to contain them we should do it now. Why is President Xi calling his generals to, pre to prepare for war? Why is uh, uh, iPhones producer uh, Foxconn, why, is, why are they relocating to India? You know, all the signs said, it, this is like Europe in the 1930s. I, I can almost ask a bigger question. Why are certain villains created at a certain time? Yeah, oh well. But yeah, the same in the 1930s. And I don't want to, to compare this to World War II because that, that was the worst we've seen. But you can see the signs on the wall, and you had people in the 1930s, especially Jewish people, mm -hmm. they fled to Canada, or they fled to uh, mm -hmm. Africa, and, and, and well, they made the right decision, because they were, do, they were reading the tea leaves, and they were criticized by their family, <laughs> you know, won't happen, and I'm not, I'm not warning World, World War III will happen, but this is a very, this is becoming very unstable. Just circling back to the BRICS and a reserve currency backed by gold, I mean, that, that was the talk. Now, the pushback will be, well, if that were the case, the U.S. has more gold than all the BRICS combined, and it will just become, a, look, you, you hear it, right? You, yeah. you hear things ranging from, ranging from it's a great idea to it's absolutely absurd to it's never going to happen to no. it's impossible for the BRICS to carry this but out. But that's why a... A gold revaluation helps all, <laughs> yeah. but it helps the BRICS a bit more than the US, but it, it helps the US as well. And that's, I'm not the only one saying this. Actually, I think uh, R Jim Ricketts was first. Uh -huh. He always he said, he always, he always said, yep. the US has 8,000 tons of gold. Yes. Or, well, we can't check it, but let's, let's presume it's there uh -huh. for it knocks. Yeah. Um, Europe has over 10,000 tons. And, and he always said that there's this secret agreement, a silent agreement between China and and, and, and the U.S. And that that that's an agreement post Lehman, that uh, China uh, would be allowed to uh, accumulate as much gold as as Europe, and 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 and, and now we reach that point, and now we can revalue gold, and, and that the Western central bankers are telling it to me now, and are asking me to write a piece about it. Yeah, it's telling. It's still a very hawkish Fed. They're far from their 2% inflation target. What, what's, your, what's your latest take on what the Fed has to do, wants to do? I mean, It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And the next easing cycle has already arrived. You don't see it in the yeah. core. You know? 
countries like Chile and Brazil, I wrote it down here because I, I don't want to make a mistake, they already cut rates. It Cer doesn't matter. Certain countries already stopped raising rates. I think Canada is one of them, maybe Australia. And the Fed will maybe pivot last, or the ECB will pivot last, but at, 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 with the weaker countries, you already see the easing cycle, the next easing cycle has started. And we all know the economy is getting very hard hit in the US, in Europe, everywhere. So, I mean, we, we, we're being told such different things. So on that point, I mean, we started the year, a recession was you know, going to happen 100%. Now we're seeing the banks even reevaluating, say, not so much. But now we see, you but know, the auto technical. workers. That's, that's, right. that's just technical, uh, whether we're in a recession or not. Go out, talk to I the know, people. I know, you're right. Can they pay I, I am, I am. I spoke to some truckers yesterday saying it's not like what it was at all. And, you know, I come to the U.S. every year, but I'm shocked by the prices I need to pay, you know, for just a bottle of water. And I, I bought a small bottle of water at the airport and saw M&M's, a small package, $10, $10. <laughs> this, this is... I, I was going to say, I was just in Rome. It's not just, it's not no, just it's here. It's everywhere. But Willow. it's the, 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 the basement Seven of Seven euros for a bottle of water. Yeah. yeah. But actually, money is dying, and we've been talking about this a lot. And it's scary because inflation, you, we can solve all these crises by printing money. We, we can't solve inflation by printing money. We can only bring inflation down by using a very soft economy. So when do you say when people say, but they can't bring inflation down because it's the only way for the U.S. to get out, out of this debt? Which actually, they need inflation in a way to inflate away the debt. Yeah. But so in a way they need to inflate, but I'm afraid rates come down, interest rates come down now. Um, um, we have an incredible cost in the ec economy because they really try to bring the economy almost to a halt to bring the inflation down. And then we'll get the next wave of inflation. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid for that one. You're afraid in, for that? In, yeah, in 24, 25, the next wave of inflation. Worse than this. If you study, large trends, they always have three phases. If you look at the inflation in the 60s and the 70s, it had three phases. And often the, 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 the second and the third phase are, are the strongest ones, and we just had the first one. So I, inflation hasn't been contained yet. And look what happens to energy prices. Look what happens, uranium is breaking out That's now. Right. Oil is breaking out. Uh, well, the U.S. sold almost all of their oil reserves trying to contain price. So, Do you think things will get even more interesting once the election campaign kicks off here? Well, elections will be crazy. One guy could be in jail and the other one, uh, <laughs> he, he well, doesn't know I brought up, left from you right. Know, you must have seen RFK saying he would ban fracking. One of the real problems is, I wrote down four major trends, four, four major problems. One is we reached the end of the, down, the, the, the declining interest rates, which was a 40-year trend. Tailwind is headwind now. Uh, other trend is the end of the boomer generation, mm -hmm. who kept saving and saving, will now start uh, well, using their savings. Another trend, huge trend, is... Um, the end of fossil fuels. There are many out there, especially in the political, uh, political arena, who try to tell us, investors, who we shouldn't invest in fossil fuel companies anymore. But this, is, this has been a trend. We, we, used, we needed fossil fuels for over 100 years. We can't do without them. Even 50% of the oil is not used for transportation, but just for plastics, you know, paint, everything. We can't change the system overnight. So that's, that's a huge problem. And there's one other major trend, and that's the, 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 the globalization trend stopped, and now, now it's deglobalization. So these are four, four yeah. major trends causing a lot of trouble so let's, and stress. So you, we, we just threw a lot at the folks at home. Um, and I know you've been writing and talking about this. And to circle back on your original thesis, you know, your, 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 mm. your, your international bestseller, The Big Reset, where are you at? Where are we at? How far? I mean, we keep inching closer to it. The reset is not a binary. Um, right. There's no start and end. No. But like I, like I um, uh, phrased it before, it's slowly then suddenly. 
and, and we, we seem to be at the start of the suddenly phase. Look what's happening yeah. over, almost overnight with yeah. the BRICS, with the central banks uh, all accumulating gold now, with the revaluation of gold talks. Think, I'm quite sure within the next 12 to 24 months, we'll see some more major moves, uh, big changes. And it's almost like um, everything is happening faster and faster. You, you almost, c we, uh, uh, as being in industry professionals yeah. or journalists, yes. you almost can't keep up with all the news, you know? I made a long list because there's, and there's so more, much. And there was more. Yeah, so when like I'm going over, like when people are, you know, how do you prepare for an interview? I mean, <laughs> you're, I'm just picking the top points here. Oh, yeah, but I mean, we could, we could go on points. and on. Yeah. I want to bring up the elephant in the room now, and we can wrap on this. Yeah. The last time you were on, we spoke about the World Economic Forum. And my the uncle, the Klaus Schwab. And, and well, that was the <laughs> feedback. Why is, you know, I invite yeah. everyone to revisit that interview. Yeah. Why is Willem defending Klaus? I wasn't and defending I, I know, him. That, that was, I know, because I've known you for so long. I'm yeah. thinking, like, anyone who knows Willem knows he's not defending Klaus Schwab. So I'm not sure no. why that was the interpretation, but it, because but it was. Because I try to tone it down, like the British. When I write, <laughs> when I write stuff for the Omvis, right. they always say to me, please right. tone it down. Right. Because that's... <laughs> and... I didn't want the interview to get hijacked by right. very don't strong. Want red flags. And, 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 and I know how sensitive this is. And I, I only said, you know, Klaus Schwab is 80 years old, over 80 years. You know, his time is, has passed almost. And the BRICS development, you don't... Is there anybody seriously out there who thinks the BRICS will, will listen to Klaus Schwab? No. So Vladimir Putin one day was on the Young Global Leader list on the WEF website. They took him off. You know, so there's this big divide now between the East and the West. And the World Economic Forum, I think it's a very dangerous <laughs> think tank. <laughs> I think it's a very dangerous group. Um, but the bricks will blow them away. I, I wanted you to share more on that because I know we've had good conversations about how Trudeau and company really want a seat at, the, at this relatively new concept, right? Like, look at the power the World Economic Forum has gained in such a short amount of time. But they're losing it now. Trudeau, listen what people say when he walks the streets. You know, Trudeau is, is surrounded by a security detail of at least 15 people, you know. So th they're really scared that somebody's trying to hit him or to do, or to, <laughs> to do whatever he, he doesn't like. Look at Macron. He's been slapped in the face a few times in the public. Uh, our Dutch leader, uh, Rutte, who once called me when I was dr driving my car because he wanted to discuss the reset. And I, I was friends with him after lunch and dinner, but I became very disappointed by the way he... He, he, well, he, he, he chose to be in Davos all the time and to listen to Klaus Schwab, but he's leaving now. I think this, this generation of young global leaders, they will be gone. We have elections coming up in the Netherlands. It's all anti-government, you know, in the polls now. Are so think, the mood is changing very rapidly. And, and that's getting, it's getting dangerous because once the general public starts to protest and react. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm getting a bit nervous at times because there's so many trends changing and there's so much instability. And this, 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 you know, this is for turning stuff. You know what I mean? You're, uh, you're concerned about uprisings. The great book by Neil Howe, The Fourth Turning, which says every 80 year you enter this new cycle and you always see a lot of crisis, war and instability before you reach the, f the next phase of peace yeah. and prosperity. Yeah. And, and uh, if you ask him what years you expect the crisis and wars, he will say between 2020 and 28. We're in the middle yeah, of you it. Just, you, just, you just killed me with that. This is, it's absolutely yeah. terrifying, but it's real stuff. And, yeah, and uh, as we an can't investor, bury our head. we can't no, bury our heads in no, the sand. No, we, we should be open and we should be uh, yeah. investigating. And as, as an investor, you should be very flexible. And I have so many rich people coming up to me now and ask, Willem, where do yeah. we need to move? Yeah. Well, Even Americans go to Portugal. Well, well, let me, let me bring, let me, let's wrap on this. Let's wrap on a lighter note. We're at a mining conference. Yeah. 
people want to know where, which, where should I be investing. Like I said, I was on a panel with, with Pierre Lasson and Justra and Friedland and three mm -hmm. titans. One thing Lasson brought up was regarding to the juniors. He was saying right now they're like fireflies that they might hit something great, but they, they'll vanish. And it's going to be very, very difficult for them right now. But on the other end, I see the Department of Defense in the U.S. giving huge grants to Talon Metals, a nickel explorer, to help them speed up their discovery. I see General Motors investing $650 million in a lithium developer. So there's a bifurcation in our industry as well. As where it's easier to permit and not? Where it's easier to get money. The Saudi... Watch the Saudis. They're changing everything. Yeah, that's right. They pivoted to Iran. They want to be to attract the best golfers and soccer players, but they want to be big in mining. Yes, I predict. Yes, I predict yes, they'll, yes. they'll do a major. They will do major M and A transaction within twelve months in mining, and everybody will be shocked. I believe that. Yeah, because I, you know the industry, I, 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 yeah. but the general public will be surprised. Hey, are the Saudis buying this copper discovery somewhere down in the Andes or the Middle America? Yes. Yeah. And could it be that we may see a future where all the Arab nations will be bigger and stronger than Europe? You know, I'm active on Twitter. I, I tweeted part of a speech by MBS, yes. the Saudi leader. <laughs> That's who said it. <laughs> he said, in I five stealing years, his thunder. Uh, in five years, we'll be the new Europe. Yeah. And, you know, I bought two properties in, in, in Dubai because I want to have a feel for, for how it's like there and how the system works. You can buy properties. You can buy real estate in Dubai without being there. You don't have to go. You, you can it's do it easy. all online. It's easy. They'll send the stuff to you. They cut all red tape. They're so smart. And um, they need all the money in the world to develop Dubai, to right. develop Dubai, uh, to to de to develop um, Saudi Arabia as well. Um, of course, they have a bit of their own. But uh, yeah. MBS, he, he he made he made it very clear. He's going to open up yeah. Saudi. They will even start to. Well, you will be able to drink alcohol there, and and and, and tourism will become a big thing. Really good stuff, as always. Will in Middlecope, come by any time. Come find me. <laughs> Could go <laughs> on for hours. I'll see, I'll, I'll see you in Zurich. That's yeah, yeah. Sure. Oh, that's in a few weeks. A few weeks. Yeah, yeah. Willem, thank you. And thank you all for watching. Fantastic conversations, folks. Stay tuned to the Daniela Camboni Show. We'll have more for you from the Denver Gold Forum. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.